Hi, this is uh, Pia Knudsen from uh, UFO Denmark, and uh, this evening we would like to welcome Erika Lux. Uh, Erika Lux has her own uh, radio program and uh, has done a lot of research, uh, was a former MUFON researcher, and has uh, recently done a lot of programs surrounding the Skinwalker Ranch case. Um, good evening, uh, Erika, welcome. Good evening. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And I want to just uh, give everyone around the world my love and blessings. This is a really unusual and trying time, and I hope everyone is safe and, and healthy. Yes, it is. Uh, and uh, we also hope that uh, you and your family and, and everyone in the United States, uh, it seems pretty bad at the moment, uh, but uh, I hope things quickly get better. I do too. Thank you. Would you like to, uh, you can just begin where you, where you feel uh, sure. you want to, yeah? <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I, I will give you a little bit of background on myself. Um, I am a professional vocalist. I own a Pilates studio and I've always been very artistic. I love to paint. Um, and from a very, very early age, I began to find an interest in UFOs and uh, you know, Bigfoot uh, paranormal happenings. And I remember in third grade, and I'm really glad my grandmother kept all my school papers because about a year and a half ago, I was thumbing through uh, the papers and I found a couple drawings that I'd done in grade school. And amazingly enough, instead of having like Barbie or unicorns or, or something like that, I actually had aliens and spaceships <laughs> in my <laughs> drawings. And so it was, I was hooked at a young age. And I began to read as much as I could. I had several experiences uh, throughout my young adulthood that were quite unusual. And in my 20s, I lived in a haunted house. It was very unusual and wonderful, exciting. Um, it, was, it was on the news. It was an old 100-year-old house. And it was right next to a polygamist compound. And we had lots of interesting experiences, interactions with something. We still don't know what it was. It was very benign, but that really, again, just kind of piqued my interest. In uh, my early 30s, I actually decided I had to go to Europe to do some Pilates testing for students. And I decided that I was gonna grab my girlfriends and we were gonna stay in all the haunted castles down Ireland. And we've got some stories with that one. It was a great adventure. And in 2013, I was sitting on my patio, which overlooks the Salt Lake Valley. And every night I would sit there because it's just a spectacular view with all the clouds and the mountains and the planes coming into the Salt Lake International Airport. So I was sitting there with a girlfriend one night and we saw this light that was hovering over the Ochre Mountains, which wasn't a typical place where you would see air traffic. And this light was just one single light, an amber orange kind of a sphere uh, that was hovering there. And we looked at it, got out the binoculars. We couldn't see any navigation lights. It was hovering in place for upwards of, of 20 minutes. And then a, a smaller object, it appeared, dropped out of the bigger object and then flew in a circle around the larger object. And then they both took off together and we were curious as to what that was you know again we didn't see any navigation lights as you would if you were seeing uh, an aircraft and that really piqued my interest and so every day for months i would get out my video cameras and my cameras and i would sit out there and see if i could photograph things and i did capture some very unusual things I also began doing research. I had friends that were pilots, commercial pilots, and they were at the home and I showed them some of the, the videos and they said that it was unusual. That wasn't a typical flight path. We also, I began, you know, as I was investigating things and getting my interest peaked, I also knew that we had some of the most restricted airspace in the world. You know, we have, we're the home to the NSA. Uh, 80 miles away from where I am and in my line of sight uh, is, is Dugway Proving Ground. It's over um, in between a mountain range. You can't actually see Dugway, but it was, you know, very close in the, the line of sight, like I was saying, to where I was seeing these objects. And we also have hundreds of thousands of acres for the Utah Test and Training Range. So we have a lot of military uh, stuff going on here. 
And for me, seeing an unusual object in the sky, knowing that we're so close to places like Dugway, which is a chemical and weapons testing facility, uh, it made me wonder not only from a safety aspect, but it just really pumped up my curiosity. So from there, I joined MUFON, uh, Utah. And at that point in time, it was a, a pretty fractured chapter. The former state director was a woman by the name of Elaine Douglas. And Elaine Douglas had been with MUFON for two decades. She had done a great job, but she tried to, she realized that there were some significant questions about MUFON and the way cases were being hidden. And the fact that then you had during this period of time, Robert Bigelow coming in to purchase the database. And that raised a lot of red flags with her because she felt at the time that there was something more going on, that he wasn't just somebody coming in and, and buying a database, that she felt there were government connections. She was eventually uh, kicked out of MUFON and she just began digging and digging and had hundreds, hundreds of papers on her research with regard to MUFON, some of the tax implications. She felt there were some, some issues with the taxes. And then she also did a lot of digging into Bigelow and everything. And so I took over for her um, and I rebuilt the chapter. I eventually became state director. I was state director for a while and also worked right under Jan Harzan as a communications uh, person helping Roger Marsh, Jan Harzan. And I won, um, I was, it was a nice honor. I won the, one of the volunteers of the year award with a handful of other people two years in a row at the symposium. So that was really fun. I felt, you know, it was a really exciting chance for me to educate the public. I had a lot of hope in MUFON at the time and was gung-ho about it. But towards the tail end of my time at MUFON, I began to realize that what Elaine had said was true, that yes, there were really important cases that had completely disappeared from the database. And as a state director, that I asked the question to Jan Harzad and several other people at the organization, why is this the case? We should be in there be, we should be able to see these reports, we should be able to learn from them, and why, why are they disappearing? And of course, I was met, you know, with, with no answer, <laughs> or, you know, the, the MUFON shuffle, song and dance, you know, uh, type of thing. But I also um, had a case, and this was right at the very end of my time before I resigned at MUFON, it was the American Airlines case. And that case was an airlines that was flying over Nephi, Utah, and I had a friend who was a DJ at the time, a radio host. He'd stay up late at night and scan radio frequencies. And one night after midnight, he overheard a transmission uh, between a flight crew and air traffic control. And the flight crew was concerned because there was a, a large orange object that was underneath the plane. And according to him on one of the transmissions, he was saying it was keeping pace with the plane. So I spoke with my friend, Pat Daniels, and I got his testimony. My assistant state director, Jeff Cox, and myself went through air traffic control. You can get, go to their, their website and you can listen to all the transmissions. We were able to find enough there that we could, we called in Bill Puckett, who was amazing at doing radar data analysis. We called him in, we found a good portion of that. We submitted a FOIA request and then we received a, a great deal of information, which was a surprise to all of us. And there were radar returns that uh, he picked up and they were in a, a six mile radius. And it was over 20 minutes where you were seeing these anomalies. He did extensive research and sent it to different uh, experts all over the world. And it was, it was truly anomalous. And, that was around the time when I started to get a lot of pushback from certain people in, in MUFON. Um, I'm not sure whether it was uh, just, you know, people get jealous. There's a lot of different dynamics that go on. But I ended up uh, resigning along with my assistant state director. And interestingly enough, I had learned from the person that took over as the assistant state director after I resigned 
that MUFON headquarters allegedly allocated $2,000 for this person to hire a private pilot to fly over the area of the sighting, which made international news, by the way, because it was a huge, huge case that probably most people haven't heard about, which is unfortunate, but uh, he was paid to fly over that in attempts to discredit and debunk um, one of the best radar cases MUFON has ever had. So that kind of started, <laughs> that was, that's when I decided that I, I needed to go out on my own. And I had been fostering relationships from, from, with different researchers around the world and people that I really held in high regard. I, I have a friend, Ted Rowe, who is the executive director of NARCAP. NARCAP has been around for two decades and they research uh, aviation, commercial and military pilot sightings. They've written a lot of great research papers, some of the best in the world. And then I turned to Dr. Massimo Teodorani, who's an Italian astrophysicist and has been to several locations, hotspots in the world. Some of those locations I've been fortunate enough to travel to as well to do research. There was one specific place in Southern Arizona that I went with Ted Rowe and uh, Jeff Cox and Dr. Massimo Teodorani, Erling Strand from Heshtal in Norway had also been there, um, several other people because it's such, it was such a hot spot. I also had the pleasure to travel over to Norway and visit the kids. Uh, the, the, they're not kids, I sound like Grandma Moses here, <laughs> but the, the college students there uh, to, to go to science camp and really understand how to utilize the scientific method to study all of the uh, things that were taking place in Norway. And so that was just an amazing experience. And I was very grateful that I had people like that that I could turn to to better my education and understanding on how to do research. And I also turned to people like Barry Greenwood, who, if you don't know who Barry Greenwood is, he is, in my opinion, the world's foremost archivist and historian. He wrote a groundbreaking book in the 80s with Larry Fawcett called Clear Intent. They did, they spent years doing FOIAs to try to get the different uh, papers from the government talking about UFO research. And so he's been a big help to me. He started helping me get an archive here. And I now have one of the best historical archives in the Western United States. And so I have, I had all these wonderful people to pull from and to really learn from. And so that has been one of my, my blessings that I've met so many great people that are willing to, to help mentor me. And I also want to give a shout out to Gordon Lohr. I'm co-authoring a book with him. Gordon Lohr is a brilliant man. He was with NICAP in the late sixties and that organization uh, was eventually, according to Gordon and others involved, was eventually shut down by the CIA. And that is an, a, an interesting story in and of itself. And then interestingly enough, you've got MUFON that pops up on the scene. I don't know, what's the connection there? But um, <laughs> so it was, it was, it's been a real fun learning, learning process. And I've met some people that have dedicated their lives to this. And oftentimes they don't get recognition. Right now, for me, it is really critical because we're in a, a point in history where we have all the older generations dying off. A lot of times, they're, unfortunately, their work is tossed into the trash or it is uh, scooped up by organizations like MUFON who have no desire to ever make it public, which is unfortunate. And now what we're seeing with To The Stars Academy and some of these new people that have popped up on YouTube, what we're seeing is the, the fact that history is going to be rewritten on the topic. And that is very concerning, very, very, very concerning to everyone involved. And so there's a question here about the CIA uh, shutting down NICAP. I went to California and I interviewed Gordon Lohr about this and he knew towards the end, both he and, and Hall, Richard Hall, they, uh, felt that their phones were being tapped. Um, there was a point in time when a couple gentlemen from the intelligence community came into NICAP and wanted to see specific cases. They also brought in uh, someone that had worked with the CIA, uh, Stuart Nixon, to uh, work in the office and then things began to unravel. And the people there at the time, like Gordon Lohr, knew that something 
was, was really rotten. And so each of them began to take the files out of NICAP headquarters. They Xeroxed all the files and then they got them to safe places. And that is a, a really good thing. Eventually there were some quote unquote financial problems that took place and eventually shut NICAP down. But it really, you know, according to people like Gordon, it really was the intelligence community that wanted to see the organization stopped. So it was, it was just, it's an incredible story. And it's one of those things that we need to, to look at historically when we look at the different organizations, NICAP, and then we look at MUFON, and we look at, you know, To the Stars Academy and some of these APRO, uh, some of the connections perhaps that were there. Why would the intelligence community have an interest in infiltrating these organizations? Uh, it's a great question. And of course they would because people are seeing not only UFOs, uh, but they are also probably witnessing uh, military tests, uh, experimental aircraft. And so there would be a need for the intelligence community to get in there and have a handle on what was what is taking place and also what is being put forth to the public. So it is, um, it, it's really, it's an interesting history and, and I love it. And I'll be posting some interview, uh, interviews with Gordon Lohr on my website, UFO Classified, coming up, you can look at those. And so um, there's a question here about uh, Louise Elizondo saying that they have material from UFOs. I'm not sure um, if, if that's Art's part. Um, <laughs> I think that there, there are a lot, of, a lot of things being thrown out there now. And unfortunately, there is not a lot of evidence to support that. We're not seeing uh, substantial things. We're not seeing chains of custody on videos. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, what, what is the true motivation? Are some of these people involved with contractors? Are they trying to get funding? Um, is this just another push by the intelligence community to muddy the waters? I think that that's probably in all likelihood exactly what's taking place uh, with To the Stars and uh, Luis Elizondo, but it could be wrong. <laughs> So um, I also have um, another question and, and you know, getting into um, my research in the Uinta Basin, I, because I'm from Utah and because Utah is a really interesting place, we have Skinwalker Ranch that we know has made international news, especially as of late because of the new TV show that has just come out and also the, the $22 million contract, OSAP contract, uh, where they were studying. And according to some people, they put a majority of the money into research at Skinwalker Ranch. You have all of these things that are coming out about that. But before all of this Skinwalker business started back in the, the late 90s, we had a man, a gentleman here by the name of Dr. Frank Salisbury, who was a botanist here. And he did extensive research and wrote a book called The Utah UFO Display which if you haven't read it really is, is one of the best books on the topic, in, in my opinion, in the world. Dr. Salisbury met with uh, Dr. Junior Hicks, and if nobody's heard of Junior Hicks, he's one of my heroes. He's in his 90s now. He lives right outside of Skinwalker Ranch in Roosevelt, Utah. And back in the 60s, he began getting UFO reports in the Uinta Basin and people, because he was such a, a kind, just a wonderful person, uh, he was a school teacher, a science teacher, and he also was an electrician. People felt comfortable with him. And you had the, the police departments and, and tribal elders that would, if they had sightings, they would go to him. And Junior has well over 700 reports that, that go back to the 60s and are still continuing now that he has Frank Salisbury did a great deal of work on that. And that's where the Utah UFO display came from is, is the combined work of Junior Hicks and Frank Salisbury. Um, interestingly enough, if you ever come to Utah, I will take you on a little trip up to the University of Utah where they house um, a majority of Dr. Frank Salisbury's work in the UFO arena. I went up there and spent a week and went through hundreds and hundreds of files. And there were some very, interesting communications between people like Dr. Jacques Vallée uh, and Dr. Salisbury and many other people. So it was a very eye-opening experience for me. And it was also intriguing for me to see 
uh, throughout the years, Dr. Frank Salisbury, he was, he's, he was LDS, he's passed away, so is Junior Hicks. And it was interesting to see in all these papers how they, they, that he struggled with the religious aspect with regard to the UFO phenomenon. And eventually he was um, told to back off by people at his school, but it was a, a, something that he, he studied his whole life. So that really is, is a great book. Um, how does the Utah UFO display differ from Hunt for the Skinwalker? Hunt for the Skinwalker, um, as we know, was put forth by, written by George Knapp and Dr. Colm Kelleher. And that was taking place specifically on, at the ranch, Skinwalker Ranch, and talked about different cattle mutilations, about bulletproof wolves, different stories that were coming from the Shermans. And uh, George Knapp wrote this, the secondhand information from Kelleher. And it was, really was the, the, the piece that put Skinwalker Ranch on the map. As I look back on things now, do I think it was um, maybe a primer for, for Skinwalker Ranch? Uh, was it a primer for people to conduct a psyops uh, in this area? I think it might have been. So it's, it is, it's, it's a, the whole thing is really, really fascinating. So I definitely would recommend reading both of those books. So, um, and I also want to say when I um, started researching the Uinta Basin, really put everything into it and Skinwalker Ranch, this was, oh, years ago, I began um, interviewing different families in the area. I interviewed a, a family. There was a son who worked in the oil fields right outside of Skinwalker Ranch, and he had called me one day and, and said that he had seen many UFOs over the past few years in the oil fields. And he also told me about his grandmother who had had a sighting. She was out rock hounding with her family near the ranch and she disappeared for a couple hours and her family was very concerned. So when they finally found her, she was disoriented and she had a series of, of little uh, round radiation burns on her stomach. She went to the doctor and the doctor in, in the town uh, in Vernal said that these were radiation burns. I definitely wanted, we all wanted to get a hold of um, the medical records. Um, we had a permission, but unfortunately the doctor passed away and the records were no longer available. But I began to, to do interviews over the years and collect information on this area. And then back, oh goodness, last year in, in June, I was put in contact with a fellow by the name of Chris Marks, who has now become my husband, conveniently. <laughs> and Chris Marks was a, he was an investigator and a security guard at, um, at Skinwalker Ranch. He worked for Bigelow Aerospace and he was there from 2000. He, he left Bigelow at, in 2019. But Chris, one day, he never paid much attention to things. It was, he's in the military. He had a very, very unusual experiences there. He lived there off and on for six years and spent more time out there than anybody really mapping the, the locations on the ranch, sleeping without a tent in some of the area's hot spots at the ranch. But he saw a video one day, he was thumbing through uh, YouTube videos and he saw a trailer for uh, a movie on the ranch. And he was pretty upset by that trailer. And so he decided that he needed to come forward and shed a little more truth on the ranch. And I really, that was a, an opening experience to him. So I talked to him for several hours and then I did a series of interviews with him on UFO Classified. And his first interview was very interesting because he, he loved Skinwalker Ranch. He thought it was a beautiful place. He had had, like I said, several experiences, including seeing a, uh, a man standing on the ridge, on Skinwalker Ridge, that was uh, standing very close to the edge and the man uh, bent over. And then the next thing he sees, he sees the man turn into a wolf and then walk down down uh, the mountainside. 
he actually did collect forensic evidence and had footprints of the, the man, the uh, human prints, and then the wolf prints. And of course, the, the DNA and all of, all of the testing went to Bigelow and is in the, the where are they now file, you'll never get to see it. <laughs> and so he had some of these experiences. He also had experiences where he would be in the trailer at night and the door would, would uh, slam open and he could hear footsteps walking across uh, the, the trailer. He once at one point in time also saw um, a Native American man wrapped in a yellow cloth that was just that just materialized in front of him and it was these were interesting experiences he was also asked uh, by Colm Kelleher and the higher-ups at, at Bass to do EVP recordings and so they would he and his partner Chris Bartell who I'm in, I've interviewed as well he's also uh, in, in the military they went out to the old homestead which if you see pictures um, uh, and hopefully we'll have some in the, the Zoom interview, I know we will, of the old homestead. It's a very creepy set of buildings, but they were told to go there and conduct EDP sessions. And so this was very interesting. So in his first interview, he really, really had a lot of nice things to say about Robert Bigelow and Kelleher. And then as we began getting more and more information, we got uh, the, we found out uh, about the uh, solicitation sheet for, thanks to uh, Mr. Stephen Aftergood from the Federation of American Scientists. This was dated uh, January 16th, 2019, but he asked for the solicitation sheet for the OSAP contract, which is the 22 million, and that is the Advanced Aerospace Threat and Identification Program contract. And we began to really dig into this, and it was really interesting because there were a set of 38 uh, papers that they were uh, they had done, and some of the papers really struck uh, alarm in all of us. And that one of them was the biosensors, another one was field effects on biological tissues, brain machine interference, and then a, a big one here, number 25, laser weapons. They were also in the contract supposed to be studying um, RF and do weapons. And so we put the pieces together and Chris and his colleague, Chris Bartell, mentioned that they were flown to a really interesting clinic in Reno to get an MRI done. And they were wondering at the time, it's like, why, you know, we're going out to a ranch, we're doing these reports, what in the world would we need an MRI for? But they did it. It, it. it was something that was required of them. They didn't really think anything more about that until just recently. There were other guards that I've, I've spoken with that worked for Bass that were also subjected or, or given tests flown on a Sunday evening to this interesting clinic in Reno again. Um, and given these MRIs and also some of the guards at the property also were uh, told they had to give urine samples. And so very peculiar, they were never told why. Well, actually, they actually may backtrack. They were told a couple of them that this was because they were potentially, they wanted to see how a person's brain would interact with paranormal phenomenon. So that was interesting. They were never told any results, of course. Um, according to one of the guards that was uh, one of the investigators from Bass that was there for the MRI, he feels fairly certain, although he can't be 100% certain, that the person that picked them up from the airport and took them to the Reno Clinic for the MRI was Dr. Kit Green, who wrote uh, one of the papers on human uh, effects, biological effects on the topic. And so there was also another point in time where there were a couple scientists that came up just for a brief period of time. They, they came to the ranch and they did a bean sprout experiment. And you can find pictures of this online. It was very interesting and, and the people that were living at the ranch were quite perplexed because they brought in bean sprouts um, and then they, they had some back at Bigelow Aerospace as well, but they weren't, it wasn't necessarily a controlled study. 
the bean sprouts that were placed in the trailer uh, where the, the people were living, Chris Marks, Chris Bartell, the other people that were sent to the ranch to do investigations, um, they, the bean sprouts actually, when you look at them, were quite deformed and brown and they weren't growing like the bean sprouts back at Bigelow Aerospace. So one wonders if they were actually checking for radiation on the ranch. And we believe now, especially given some of the new information that's coming to light through the work of the new team at the ranch, you know, we're now finding out that there are dangerous levels of radiation that are going over the ranch. They're so dangerous that it is not safe for humans to be there. And so what was, uh, what were the guards, uh, the investigators for Bass, what were they exposed to? Um, we also have people like Dr. Kit Green and, and Eric Davis and other people that were involved with NIDS and were involved with Bigelow saying that many people went to the ranch and they were severely injured, that there were life-threatening injuries and that people would have long-term effects from this. And so this really got to uh, Chris Marks, my husband, and to Chris Bartell because now you've got the top people saying that there are health implications they don't have any answers from Bigelow or that team, but they were put in harm's way very clearly, whether it was because of the UFO phenomenon out there or whether it was because they were actually testing non-lethal weapons, which is the area that I'm kind of leaning towards now uh, is, has happened given the OSAP contract and different things that took place on the ranch that we now are seeing deployed in theater. Uh, plasma balls, uh, different types of brain to uh, skull uh, communication, the voice to skull communication, different things like that. It really is, um, it's, it's a very curious thing. It's very alarming. And I, I have to just state that giving, watching Chris Marks and Bartell go through this discovery process and then putting the pieces together and remembering comments from from Bigelow or from people in the upper echelon where they were specifically told by Bigelow not to go on the ranch because people were getting cancer and people were having serious health implications, but yet they were sent out there and not told a thing. Um, and so they're, you know, they, they're concerned, they're scared uh, as they should be. And it also has been um, very interesting to watch uh, people like Dr. Eric Davis or some of the the bloggers that have come out of nowhere that are clearly taking a big pro TTSA stance, how they are coming out and attacking uh, all of us and, and saying we're up in the night um, and that we're just looking for a big payoff, which is, is just ludicrous. But I guess, you know, that's what they have to say when they're trying to cover their rear ends. <laughs> but um, that's a good, good, it's not, it's obviously not going to happen though, because there's too much too much information now and there's too much people are opening their eyes to what really took place at Skinwalker Ranch. Um, so, and then there's a, a question here about uh, Dr. Travis Taylor that he um, uncharacteristically had a nightmare quite often while staying at the ranch. Um, Chris, I don't recall him having nightmares. He did have, uh, he was very, very drained though, uh, as were all the other guards when they came home. In fact, they were given uh, two to three days to recover from being at the ranch before they went back to work at Bigelow Aerospace. But um, it was interesting. And I wanna just note too, Travis Taylor has, has come out now because he's on the new series and I wish them the best of luck. I, I know several people involved with that and they're really great people. But Travis Taylor has been asked specifically about the non-lethal weapons testing at the ranch, and of course, he's going to have to deny it. I found his comments about him being a, a, a contractor and, and studying non-lethal weapons and working for all of these uh, branches of the government, but, but it, you know, nothing was going on there. Plausible deniability is a great thing. And of course, when you're, you're testing on people without their knowledge, there are implications there. So I'm sure backtracking and is, is a perfect thing. I also want to just point out here that George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell and Colm Kelleher have all mentioned on different occasions that they, that Kelleher and co knew of, of contractors that were deploying toys 
on and around the ranch. So, you know, there you've got a statement there. When you put these things together, it, it, like I said, it raises some very serious implications that we need to be aware of, and especially the people that live in that community. I think they, it would, it, they should really look in, into all of this. Um, the examinations of the the Kotaman and uh, the Kotaman Pud, um and I know I'm saying that wrong in the antenna um, and and things that was that was studied from from my understanding that was something that Kit Green and Gary Nolan have also been studying for quite some time but given the MRIs that were taken and some of the things uh, that have have come out about that um, I'm sure they were they were definitely looking for that and I'm sure I would be willing to bet that Chris Marks and Bartell that their MRIs were potentially involved in that study. So very, very interesting stuff. Um, health problems with Chris Marks and Bartell, uh, you know, there are I'm not, I won't speak for Chris Bartell. Um, I will let him do that. I, I think that Chris Marks, I mean, he's, both of them have, have felt that being on the ranch, that they have been exposed to something and that the way they react to things has changed. And so they are quicker to, to, uh, to anger. They are, they've almost been desensitized by their time at the ranch. And it's been very interesting. One could wonder, and I'll just throw this out here. This is just me uh, throwing this out, but you, you wonder when you've got military vets that have been in combat, like Chris Marks, and they are they are desensitized to a lot of things, and they're put in combat situations, and they react differently than other people do. But then you have you know a perfect place for uh, contractors to test weapons that will be deployed in theater because you're testing them in a real life scenario on on people that have been in battle, and they react differently. And so I think that, that that's a very interesting thing that we need to be aware of. Are there long-term implications? You know, we don't, we don't know. Um, that is something we're going to have to really do some great uh, work, some get Chris to the doctor, um, do all sorts of things. But it's just, like I said, it's been a very um, hard process to watch him go through and, and others. And it's unfortunate. And then also, people uh, that are on the border of the ranch. I have a, a, a woman that I've been working with. Her grandfather lived right next to Skinwalker Ranch. He lived there for decades before Bigelow bought the property. And when Bigelow bought the property, there was a time he was out one night. And he was doing something with the irrigation canal and he witnessed this bright, bright beam of light that came down and it was so close to him and so bright that he, he dove into the irrigation canal and he was afraid he was going to get burned. But so people were started to experience these things, not just on the ranch, but around the ranch. And people have had some health effects and whether we can make the correlation that it's due to all of this, I don't know, that might take some doing, but it does raise some important questions. Um, so the security guards, uh, the investigators for Bass, did they have things um, that that followed them home? Uh, yes, they they have. Um, I have been near the ranch and 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 I've had experiences. I was fortunate enough to go on the ranch. Um, there were things that uh, that happened in our environment, in Chris's environment, both Chris's um, balls of light, uh, shadowy figures, loud noises, different things that affected, you know, not only them, but their families as well. And so what, whether you can say, and I know that the narrative has been promoted that it's the entity <laughs> or, you know, whatever it is uh, that's following people home, I'm not necessarily sold on that fact, given what's coming out about the potential for non-lethal weapons testing. I think there might be a little bit more to that, um, that we need to look into, and that might be what is in the environment. Uh, now, but there's a lot to be lot to be learned from all of this. Um, so that hopefully that answers your your question. Um, so also the there's a question here from from Pia, and thank you for this question. There was uh, an article written by Tim McMillan in Popular Mechanics that came out, and there was 
mention of a 10 month 500 page report that was done uh, in connection to OSAP that was uh, done uh, by Bigelow. Tim McMillan was, I, I, from his own uh, story, was shown this report just briefly on the internet in a secure site, I guess, and he was able to screenshot a couple of the pages from this 500 page report. It is curious to me to see that some of the things that were in the report were talking about um, specifically at, at the nuclear missile shutdowns uh, that happened. And there was a page of the report that looks like it was taken from the book that I mentioned, Clear Intent, authored by Barry Greenwood and, and several other things. And, and when I look at the pages that were released on the report, this 500 page report, I'm, it, to me, it looks like there's a lot of work that has been done potentially by other people where they give them credit for it. And this we don't know, we'll never know. Um, but it's just people, I, I just, I don't know how much of, I don't know what really is in the meat and bones of the report. And I'm not sure how much credence I give it knowing uh, some of the things that I know now uh, about that whole group. Hopefully that answers your, <laughs> your question on that one. Um, so it's, like I said, it's been a very, curious uh, situation for me and for Chris. And I also want to say that we have received, as we started pushing forward in all of this, we've received a lot of uh, blowback. Chris was a few months ago when he first started really making the connections between OSAP and some of the things that had happened to him. He actually received a, a glitter bomb via the mail, and uh, which was quite a shock. I was with him when he opened it and um, of course, it didn't hurt him, um, but it was in, in there, there was a little card with a devil and it says, you know, ruined days on it. And it was from a company that is specifically you, you use, you hire to send these nasty little things out to, to people that you don't like. And it was, it was, it, it's been very different. And also then some of the, the blowback that we've had on social media and, some of the really cruel attacks that we've all seen with regard to this. And it's been, it's been pretty scary, I must say. Um, but you know that you're on in moving in a right direction if you have um, some of these things happen. So the glitter bomb, um, it was, it came in a very interesting package. It was a, a cylindrical package about this big. And when we opened it, there was a loud explosion and just glitter everywhere. I mean, it was quite lovely, um, but it's, it's scary. it was a little scary, you know, to hear that. And then you just think, holy crap, you know, you're getting this kind of stuff in the mail and, and people are, are finding addresses where they shouldn't be finding addresses and things like that are happening. Um, you know, who's, who's sending up? What is the point? Is it obviously meant to intimidate or to let us know, to let Chris know that he's being watched? Um, so that was what had happened with the glitter bomb. It was very unusual and quite unnerving. Um, I know for myself uh, over the past year and a half, two years, as I have dug deeper into some of the, the people involved in, uh, in Utah, uh, as I've taken uh, people on and move on and really started to dig into the Skinwalker thing, some of the players involved, um, that I've had a series of events that have, have unnerved me. I had a man walk into my business in a, a Comcast uniform, which is our cable company here. And he said to me that he needed to see my modem because he had a signal on his computer that a cable from my modem was loose. And I thought that was very curious. And luckily I had a, a male client with me at the time who was watching the whole thing. But I, I gave this gentleman my modem because I wanted to see what he was going to do. And he took a, uh, uh, something out of his pocket, put it on the back of my modem, screwed it once, uh, turned it once, and then said he was done. And then he left and, and got in his car so quickly I couldn't get a license plate. The fellow that was with me is a computer programmer and was pretty unnerved by what he saw because as most people know, they wouldn't be able to detect, detect uh, a loose a cable like that. And in, in our cable company, you can't even get them to come out when they are supposed to. <laughs> and so it was very strange. And then the next morning, um, 
I was at my business again very early in the morning, about 6.30, I was taking the trash out and a woman pulled up to, to me in the parking lot and a very peculiar um, looking woman. And she says to me, you know, is this your business? You know, what do you do here? And, you know, I told her that I taught Pilates. And then she said, you know, she said, looked at me and she said, you have really pretty hair. You know, I've, I've been in the military and I've been trained to see things, really awful things, things that were so bad, they fractured my mind. And I'm just sitting here going, this is odd, um, you know, but she could just have not taken her medication for the day. I'm not quite sure what was taking place, but it was interesting. And then she, she said to me, there's a bluebird behind you. And so I, I bit, turned around. Um, there was no bluebird behind me, of course. And I looked back at her and she said, you know, I've been in the military. I was trained to see things, awful things. You have really pretty hair. And <clears throat> then, of course, I was a little um, taken aback. And my client walked up and just said, what is going on? And we walked uh, into the studio. And during the same time frame, I actually noticed that there was a white panel van that had been sitting across the street from my studio for two weeks in a parking lot. I asked the, sto the store uh, management of that complex, I said, if you notice this vehicle uh, there, because of course you should be concerned about abandoned vehicles and, and safety of your staff and, and different your clients, different things. Um, they had tried to get the car towed and had not been able to do that. I, after the, the person coming into my studio and also this bizarre encounter with this woman, I called a person who was a former sheriff, deputy sheriff, and he came out and drove around the vehicle. And then he called me and said, Eric, I don't want to concern you, but there is a, a video camera in, in the van and it's pointed towards your studio. And so, you know, whether this is, is you know, somebody, me being, paranoid, I don't know, but it was a series of very unusual events that that kind of set me back a little bit and made me think that there definitely were people that were paying attention to what I was doing because perhaps I was digging in uh, the right space. Have there, there's a question again from Pia, you, I thank you for your great questions. Has there been a response from, from Bigelow uh, and Co with regard to this? Um, Bigelow has not made statements, um, but he has used people like Putoff and Dr. Eric Davis to make statements and to basically say, oh no, that, that none of the non-lethal weapons testing ever took place and, you know, we're the, the, up in the night and different things like that. And so he's using the people that he employed uh, to do, to do, to run defense. And then also I'm seeing the same types of, of statements that are coming from, uh, from, the the Knapp and Corbell camp. So it's been it's been very interesting, <laughs> the whole thing. And I'm telling you, I think I've aged a um, hundred years since all of this uh, has has taken place. And so um, I'm just looking here at some of the other uh, questions. My take on the new series. Um, like I said, I know some of the people that are involved in the new series, and I think that they're they're really great people, and I, I wish them the best. I don't know where, you know, they're going to go. I'm, I'm very hopeful that this isn't going to be another Bigelow times two kind of thing where you are promoting stuff and not paying attention to some of the, the questions that are being addressed. Um, it is, it does give me hope to see though that they, in the first episode, they showed Tom Winterton's very significant injuries that took place on the ranch and that they are talking about the fact that their equipment is picking up electromagnetic radiation, dangerous levels of this. Um, and so we'll see where it goes and how the series unfolds. But um, there are lots of questions around the ranch. And another thing that I, I want to stress that I find very important is we know that there are hotspots all over the world. Norway, um, uh, uh, Southern Arizona, Yakima, different places. Uh, I'm sure that you have the same places over there. And it's interesting because in these places, especially when there are, are there is scientific research being done, there are no injuries associated with the phenomenon. And I think that's really important. Why is it just one place on the planet where you have 
significant life-threatening injuries taking place. Uh, you, you know, you can throw out uh, Polaris and some of a, a couple other sightings. You know, you've got the Betty, or excuse me, the, the Cash Landrum case, which in my opinion, and Ren Brendelsham potentially could be man-made and they did injure people. But um, there are no injuries in, in Norway and other places where they are coming into close proximity to the phenomenon. So I think that should be really uh, stressed uh, with all of this. There are places in the world where good research is being done and where people are having positive interactions. And, and I think that we need to, to focus on that, but also be very mindful that that places like Skinwalker Ranch could potentially be used as a psychological operation and to do covert, uh, covert testing on things. So, uh, you know, with that, with some of that, and I'm just looking at the, the cloaked technology around them, um, that uh, the, there was Chris Bartell and Marx and, and even Dr. Eric Davis and people mentioned the fact that they weren't given good equipment to do research and investigations on the ranch, even though uh, apparently Bigelow had tens of thousands of dollars of good equipment on his shelf at, at Bigelow Aerospace. They weren't allowed to take that and they were given pretty, uh, pretty poor equipment. And most of the security guards uh, investigators actually brought their own equipment where they could take things up and, and document the evidence. Um, and so that was curious to me. And again, that is a, a red flag. You know, why wasn't there good, why didn't they have good equipment for their investigations? And that leads me to believe because it wasn't the true investigation that was the focal point. The investigation was their reaction to the technology they were being introduced to. As we look back at the sightings that Chris had and others, in the trailer where you've got doors banging open, where you hear footsteps, where things are getting moved around. Could that have been some sort of cloaking technology? Um, it, it could have. Um, and so it, it's, uh, it, all of this is, is very interesting. And also I wanna note that there are, even now you'll, you'll notice in some of the reports coming out from the ranch now, there are specific places on the ranch where people would go and they would get such a feeling of fright and they would hear voices saying don't go any further this is is dangerous there was there's specific points so was that technology being utilized in specific that specific place to do what we now know they can do uh, for crowd control and they have done in in uh, like i said in theater the military has utilized that and and also to protect military installations um, so you've got that, and then you've got the EVPs that were being uh, uh, taped in, in the, the old homesteads. So was that, again, that kind of voice to skull type of thing? And then the cloaking technology could have been utilized um, on, on other areas. And then you've got the balls of light that were specifically seen by the East Gate and, and photographed and things. So all very curious, and it, it makes it difficult because we know that all of these things are things that can be seen in uh, the paranormal. You know, when you go to different hot spots, you'll get the, the balls of light that, you know, when you rule out the mundane, sometimes can be pretty fantastic. You do have people in paranormal hot spots that, that hear voices, that see shadows. And so a lot of this technology could be developed to mimic the paranormal, and that makes it all the more difficult to detect. And I think the, the use of, of that and in the psychological aspect can be could be pretty pretty devastating um, for for an adversary um, in in battle so um, so there is that um, do I think that more employees from Skinwalker Ranch are going to step forward um, Chris is I will say Chris is going to have more medical tests done I know that Chris Bartell has done that and they will probably have to the rest of their lives given the fact that they were probably exposed to radiation, pretty significant levels of radiation. Um, and we will be doing that. I have spoken with several other people that worked there as well that had medical tests. And I think now they're beginning to see the implications of this. They were and are a little bit, you know, they haven't been exposed to what's going on. And like Chris 
marks. They had removed themselves from the situation and didn't really think much about it, but now they are. And, you know, there is a level of concern for people's well-being, uh, mental and physical. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll see what, what happens with that. I hope people will step forward. Um, I, it's, it is my hope that that happens. It's a scary thing um, to step forward, especially if you have a, a career where you're still in the military, uh, if you have a family, if you have you know, loved ones that you care about, or your own personal safety uh, and well-being. It's, a, it's a, a tough thing to want to come forward and raise questions about uh, human testing or human exposure to, to things without consent. And I have to just stress that this was without consent. And that's really important. Um, where could the non-lethal weapons have been deployed from? I think there are probably, there are several places uh, surrounding the ranch and on the ranch that are difficult to get in. And there were specific places where people that worked for, for Bigelow were specifically told not to go. And that if they were to go there, they would be fired. So there are also, um, some, some power lines there. Uh, there are all sorts of, of places now that we're looking back at it and analyzing, okay, this happened in this specific place. Where could the technology have been to deploy something? I mean, I, I would say that things could have been moved in and moved out for these tests. But um, like I said, at the end of the day, they, were, they weren't doing, they weren't studying the paranormal. They were studying the responses to the people on the ranch to whatever this was. And that's why the reports that were submitted to them were important because they could go back and say, ah, yes, on this date, this was deployed potentially, allegedly. And this was the response. Somebody was seeing a, a figure and something, you know, somebody was sensing something. We, they were feeling a sense of dread. They were uh, overcome with nauseous, nauseousness or they were, you know, had a burn on them, all these things. And so there definitely are lots of, lots of interesting things there, but there are places on, on, in, on and around the ranch that, that things definitely could have been deployed um, for sure. So all of this, you know, like I said, has been um, heartbreaking, I think, to me, to all of us, because when, when I first started in this, I was so bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and I wanted to buy the narrative. I, I have had personal experiences in my life that are mind-blowing, and they're very special to me, and I think all of us here have had experiences that propel us to learn as much as we can, because we want to know. and it has been sad to me to see um, a place like Skinwalker Ranch or to see other, the UFO community that, you know, we're so sometimes unfortunately willing to believe that we believe in things that aren't necessarily healthy or accurate. And it is a perfect place for the intelligence community or for, you know, just bad actors to come in and either A, make money on, on gullible people um, you know, be promoting a false narrative and misleading people away from the truth. Um, and then also you've got the aspect of the fact that the intelligence community can, can come into our community and, and, you know, learn about things and, and, and do background checks on people and identify people that could potentially be um, unbalanced or a threat. I mean, there's so many aspects um, to all of this. And so it's, it's, it's mind blowing, but it is, it is, it's been a bit sad for me, like I said, to realize that we're so vulnerable and we have to pay attention to this. We have to be smart. And we have to realize that there are things going on that aren't necessarily in our, our best interests. And it also isn't in the best interest of the topic because this is a fantastic and a wonderful, and it should be an empowering topic for each and every one of us. Has Chris experienced UFO related things um, since the ranch? Uh, he has not seen uh, anything UFO since the ranch. And I wanna say too, that he never witnessed a UFO at the ranch. And this is really important because most of the guards and the, the investigators, because they were investigators and then were employed to do security, they, were, they never saw a UFO at the ranch. So, you know, was the UFO thing thrown into the narrative? I, I, I don't know. One could wonder, but they, they never witnessed UFO types of, of things at the ranch. Um, have any of the neighbors experienced 
uh, special effects in the years the Bigelow on the Ranch, yes they have, um, and on UFO Classified I interviewed, and I'll post the links uh, so you can get to it on my homepage, ufoclassified.com. They, Charles Wynn, who was a neighbor of the ranch, experienced uh, the blinding bright light, very similar to what Chris Marks experienced on the ranch. He lived right next to the ranch. Um, he experienced things as did all of the surrounding neighbors experienced things, and it was such a brilliant, you know, you get Hunt for the Skinwalker that comes out, it's this brilliant, uh, and then you've got, you've got the fact that they're taking some of the lore in that area, and they're, I believe, playing upon superstitions, they're uh, promoting things, it's very easy for things to get out of hand, and then when something does happen, and somebody is injured, then you've got this perfect cover story, oh, I have MS, because a UFO came down. And so you get people that are experiencing things, having health effects because of it, and then they blame it on UFOs. And it's, it's perfect. It really is a brilliant, brilliant strategy. But, but unfortunately, people are, are wising up to that. So um, yeah, it's, it is, it's quite curious. And I, I think, uh, do I think Bigelow space interests are part of this? I don't. I don't know from what I understand recently, um, Bigelow has laid off the majority of his employees. Uh, now I'm not sure where he'll be going or what role he's going to play in this, but definitely you see with To the Stars Academy, you see the same cast of characters, some of the people in the aviary, um, Dr. Putoff and people like that, Dr. Kelleher, who are still involved in that. And, you know, they're making a big push to, to collect data, to sweep it up, um, MUFON's involved in that now, which is comical to me. Um, <laughs> and so, um, I don't know, it's a good time. Um, what is my take on, on Brandon Fugel? Um, Brandon has, has been nothing but very kind to me. Um, like I said, I, I will be, I'll be interested to see where the show goes. Um, I hope uh, that the, the types of things that were taking place during the Bigelow days are not taking place there now with relations to people being test subjects. And I definitely hope that um, the new team on the ranch has been informed of the health implications and are, you know, definitely given an option whether they want to continue to stay on the ranch or, or not. Um, I'm assuming that, that they probably have some good things in place. So let's hope you know, that that happens uh, and more people are, are protected now. So do I think there is a distinction between the paranormal and UFOs? And that's a great question. I don't know. I don't, I, I, I can't say, I think for me and most people who really dig into this topic, I can't tell you where UFOs come in and where the paranormal leaves off. I think for me, especially in different hot spots, or if you've had a UFO sighting, you're you know you you're more prone to have paranormal things happen around you. But I can't really, you know, unequivocally say this is a UFO. Therefore, it is ET. I don't know. It's it's just un unidentified, and I can't say with the paranormal as much as I would love to say that this you know apparition that I saw was actually that of my my deceased grandmother, I would love to say that I can't say that now. I don't know where, what the origin is, origins are of the different types of, of phenomena that uh, has, has taken place, but it's definitely fascinating. And I think there's so much, there's so much potential for a whole host of things to be taking place along with the, the man-made uh, technology that is unfortunately being uh, deployed. So, um, Chris, here's another question here. Um, Chris mentioned that he had had several encounters with orbs. What were his impressions in terms of orbs or the intentions, malevolent or benevolent? Um, I think he didn't, I don't think he necessarily felt anything uh, either way. Um, you know, you have to, with, with Chris Marks, he's been in combat uh, and done several tours of duty. And so he was, they were sent to the ranch. These guys were sent to the ranch to do a job, to investigate, 
to remain emotionally detached from that. There were, there was one experience where Chris had a hard time doing that. He was out walking the ranch and there is a specific place where other people have witnessed the same types of things. He was overcome with intense emotion and he, he dropped to his knees and just started um, sobbing and they had to pull him, uh, his partner had to pull him out of that area. And so, but there wasn't an orb associated with that, but there was an intense, he was overcome with emotion um, in that regard. So uh, will, will I be allowed to go to the ranch now? I don't know. I think they've locked it down uh, quite a bit, which is a good thing. Um, I'm, I'm happy about that, especially given the, the things that are taking place, the radiation. Um, I will tell you a story because I think this is really interesting. Um, for me, I, um, I went to, I was up, up in the Uinta Basin about a year and a half ago, and it was in the fall. And I went up there to interview Junior Hicks. And I've interviewed him twice. And Junior Hicks has had some very interesting and important things to say about dealing with Bigelow and dealing with some of the NID scientists. And those are on uh, interviews that I, again, will be putting out there. They're hard to hear. He's got a very soft voice. He's a little bit older. Um, but I went out to interview him. And then that night, I, I took a person that I was with who also has been an investigator here with me in Utah. And we went out to the periphery of the ranch. We had a really great vantage point. And we could see the old homestead and, and the whole thing, the fields, the bait pins. And during this uh, time, there was a, a storm coming in. And if you've never really looked at, at Skinwalker Ranch and the land surrounding it, it is some of the most beautiful land uh, on the planet. It's just, it's absolutely gorgeous. And so you've got this thunderstorm coming in over the red, you know, red cliffs. And, and it was just spectacular. But I noticed... Um, we noticed that there was by the old homestead, there was a, a swath of light and it was almost like it was being beamed up from the ground. And I thought this was interesting and I kept, you know, okay, ruling out, is this, could this be man-made, you know, while the road is going this way, could it be a light shining up? And I, I quickly thought that I could rule out pretty safely that this, this wasn't, but then this, this light moved along the mesa and then I began to witness what I thought was uh, a mist of some sort. And it almost looked to me, and it was dark at this point, like there was a fire and there was low level smoke, but it was um, almost fluorescent. It was very strange. And so we saw this, this, the light go to this mist and the mist moved towards us across the field and then around us. And when that happened, then everything around us became very dead and it felt like the temperature dropped and then the this moved away and then this happened for for an hour and then you would see the light again and then at one point uh during this over skinwalker ridge which is a, a place where allegedly some of the the craft um come in and out of where people have seen objects go in chris i believe saw something like this um and I think Junior Hicks did as well, something fly into that, that area. But I noticed that there was a, a, an amber ball of light, again, just very similar to what I saw uh, over the Ochre Mountains in Salt Lake City when I first had those sightings in 2013. But we noticed this and that hovered there for about five minutes and then it looked like there was another object underneath it and there was some sort of um, connection between the two objects. And so we sat there and, and videotaped and photographed some of these things and it was pretty remarkable. And you know, you can hear in, in the videotape that we're just uh, flabbergasted. You know, we're, we're, we're telling everybody about the senses that we're feeling and some of these things. And again, when, uh, and they did show a beam in the first episode, which is really interesting. And also in the first episode, when you look at, they had a, a they showed a series, uh, of uh, a film, uh, I believe, film clip where this light, a uh, large swath of light kind of moved over the same area where I witnessed that uh, very same thing, I believe. And so it was very curious. But again, when I got um, home, my friend and I returned from that. We were drained for days. I mean, I felt like I couldn't move off the couch. 
And so I don't know, looking back at that, you know, was that something paranormal? Was that, was I in the wrong place at the wrong time? I don't know, but it was a very stunning experience that, that I had. So um, I don't know uh, what any of this stuff is. Uh, you know, like I said, some of these things were just beginning to put pieces of the puzzle together and trying to get answers. And we're doing a lot of research in, in with regard to some of the people that have been involved in all of these research projects. Um, Dr. John Alexander, who was, his specialty was non-lethal weapons testing, uh, very interestingly enough. Um, some of the other players involved also have been testing technologies, laser technologies and different things. And so that's also quite curious to me. So um, we don't know. Um, I, I would love to sit here and, and, and say that this is all part of a really cool phenomenon and that I should be super stoked about it. And, but I have to say in this case, I'm not, I'm, I'm concerned about what everybody has been exposed to. So, um, but I wanted to just say, and if you have more questions, uh, do I think that the Nimitz UFO is, is U.S. tech? I would say, given what I've learned about the people involved um, in this, I would, I would question whether that is our own technology and whether that was a test that was being deployed to see how people would react. Um, I don't know. I think that's a good possibility. And for people to go out there and say it's a UFO and expect the general public to believe that, even though we're kind of gullible sometimes and we, we do like to believe things like that, but we need to ask some some more questions and we also need to look at the people involved in promoting this story and what their connections are and were to the intelligence community and would they have a vested interest in stirring the narrative um i believe they, they would and i'm i'm pretty sure that uh, most of us here are smart enough to realize that could be the case as well has anybody from ttsa contacted me um no i've reached out several times um, to have them on my show. And of course that is definitely now, I think the more vocal I become about all of this, the less likely that will happen. Um, but we'll, we'll see what, what goes on, on with that. Um, but I, I wanna say too, because this the Skinwalker Ranch gets to be a lot of, especially what I've been working with, a lot of kind of gloom and, and doom. And uh, it, 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 I want to really focus on the good aspects of what the phenomenon can be and how we can empower ourselves and how we can study this. And uh, no, there are not, no nuclear sites that are close by Skinwalker uh, Ranch. Um, so, and that's another great question. But what I wanna say is it's really important right now to, I feel, to turn away from what's happening in America as far as the UFO community, um, I feel that there's a lot of a lot of a lot of misinformation, disinformation coming out. There is a very big push to steer the narrative and to rewrite history, like I mentioned at the beginning of the interview. And I feel that you know is is a great benefit to contractors who want to obtain funding. So I would definitely suggest looking to other places. I would absolutely look at Project Heston. Uh, dot org, and you can go on there and see the decades long research project that they've done in the sleepy little little uh, place in Norway that is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Where people back in the 80s, if you don't know much about it, back in the 80s, people were seeing in this, this small little village, they were seeing balls of light, they were seeing uh, strange things that were coming very close to them to their homes. And this, the town, the people became very, very concerned about this because they didn't know what it was. And so after this started to happen, they turned, at, they turned to the media and the media descended on this, this little village. And all as, as when, when the news broke, there were thousands of people that also descended upon the area because they wanted to get a good look at what was taking place. And so they were overrun by people and then the media unfortunately started to make fun of the people in this village and, and mocking them and it was very very difficult but uh much to 
much to my delight and, and their uh, delight, Erling Strand, who is a professor uh, of engineering at Otsfold College, he and his colleagues decided that this was a perfect opportunity for them to actually utilize science uh, in a groundbreaking way to study the phenomenon. And so he set out with some of his colleagues and they did, they, they lived there for weeks and they identified uh, hundreds of different types of phenomena. And they got such great stuff that they were able to go back and obtain funding. And uh, we've got, you know, I mean, 30 years later, we've got one of the most important places on the planet where they're actually conducting real research into this and they they are empowering students at the engineering college to climb mountains to spend two weeks out in the harsh elements to to capture to study the phenomenon and to really move in a progressive way they're also using uh, a lot of uh, they've got scientists from all over europe and these these people are the leading on the leading edge of science in Europe, and they are coming there. They are bringing different types of equipment. Different colleges from all over Europe are bringing pieces of equipment to go there. They have, uh, and they have had for a long time, 24/7 cameras there where you can look for the, the Heshtalan phenomena, and that is very, very cool. And so, you look at, at places like that, and no injuries again. Uh, another important thing, and you look at the great work that they've done, and you look at the fact that they've done this without all of the American nonsense uh, that has come into play that really muddies the water and discredits the subject as a whole. They have over there identified four different types of light phenomenon that behaves as if it is intelligent or intelligently controlled. And that is really big. And so when you look uh, at different places where you live, perhaps you can find window areas or hot spots. And then you look at what they're finding in Norway. That is it's a great learning tool for each of us as investigators or people that have witnessed things. And then also, again, take into account the fact there could be, you know, you have to look at where there are uh, military installations, where there are places where they could be testing things and then rule out the mundane and all of that good stuff. But but Norway is a shining example of what's right in, in research with regard to this. Um, Pia mentioned Keith Basterfield, who has been uh, just an amazing, amazing researcher. He is over in Australia. And I've always had a great deal of respect for him, but he got wind of what was taking place uh, on my radio show with regard to Chris Marks and Chris Bartell. And he's done a series of really groundbreaking blogs, articles on what has taken place. And he's actually, he did a blog on the human interface uh, and, and things with regard to Chris Marks questioning and, and Bartell, what happened with the MRIs? Was this non-lethal weapons testing? And he actually got Dr. Kit Green on the record saying in Dr. Kit Green's way, uh, that yes, Chris Marks and Chris Bartell were absolutely correct in what they were saying. And so that was really big. So I encourage you to go to Keith Basterfield's blog to, uh, to look at his work. He's, a ground, he's one of the few people that will give you good information and he knows what he's talking about. He's amazing. So, um, and so um, did the this, this MUFON star team, and here's another question, uncover anything important? Um, Hmm. I don't think we'll ever know. <laughs> I, I, you know, MUFON is not about transparency. MUFON is about buying and selling uh, information, people's personal information. It is about hiding the truth and steering the narrative and discrediting the subject. That's what MUFON is about, unfortunately. There are lots of good people involved in MUFON uh, that I, I respect and love, but unfortunately the organization as a whole is incredibly flawed. And um, so I have to just throw that out. But you know, like I said, move on star team, who knows what they uncovered. I know that during the Bigelow days when Bigelow bought the database and all people's, all of people's personal information, um, which should be concerning to everyone, um, that they, they paid MUFON people to go out and do investigations. And on some of those investigations, uh, apparently people from the Bigelow team made it there before the MUFON team and all the evidence was scooped up and swept away. And so that's unfortunate um, that we'll never know and we won't have transparency. And especially from an organization that is a nonprofit, 
that is supposed to be operating on the benefit of mankind. So perhaps each of us, if we're bored, we can actually um, write a little letter to the executive director, Jan Harzan, and ask when information will be made available, when some of the, the files that MUFON is sweeping up research, uh, Lane Douglas, I mentioned, who was very important to MUFON, deliberately went in and, and when I was supposed to be getting her important information that would have been put out to the public, um, they swept in and took up all of her research and now it will never be seen again. But luckily, some of that was scanned and given to Isaac Coy and now you can see some of that at the AFU website in their archives, which is really, really important. But I would definitely say we should be asking questions from some of the people that run these organizations and that we need to be cognizant of the games that are being played. And we need to also look back, and this is, I, I know I've said this a lot, but this is really important to me. We have to look at the history and we have to really look at the work of Jan Aldrich from Project 1947, who has done a great deal of archiving himself over the years. Uh, look at Gordon Lore, who has written several books on the topic, and also Barry Greenwood, who is my probably one of my biggest uh, advocates and mentors in the community. If you have not read Clear Intent, you need to read that book. It really lays out a lot about government secrecy in the United States with regard to the UFO phenomenon. And then look at his archives. Go back and look at the history and then ask yourself some questions. And I wanna say some people, um, and this is a really good thing uh, that P is bringing up about the Pentagon, top people are divided on the religion and the devil. And I've, I've heard different things over the years, as I'm sure all of you have, about the different factions that are at play. And so you've got the religious element over here. You've got, you know, this uh, faction over here that has a different narrative. It's the doom and gloom and the evil alien and all of this stuff, which is probably just put out there again to get funding for contractors and to take away people's power because they're saying it's a threat when I don't really believe it is. And they have not proven that it is, but um, good luck on that one. But there was a story that was put out there um, that I will really briefly uh, just talk about quickly because I think this is important. The Collins Elite was a group. Uh, Nick Redfern wrote a book 10 years ago. This is the 10 year anniversary of the Collins Elite. And this was uh, a group of people in different branches of the government that were playing with a demonic angle of things. And so there is, we have heard through some of the interviews with Harry Reid and some of that, uh, that group of people that this, this, uh, this really ultra conservative uh, group of people has shut down funding to them. And, you know, I think they're kind of throwing things out with regard to the Collins elite and things like that. And the more I researched the Collins elite, I've been working with Nick Redfern and maybe one of these days I'll write the, the second book to the Collins elite. But I'm wondering now if the Collins elite actually isn't the people <laughs> that have been uh, talking about the Collins elite. I wonder if they're actually not involved. So that's, it's, uh, it's gonna be a fun book if I ever get to, to do that. Um, how, how do I see the topic of UFOs? How has that changed since the New York Times article and, and the Senate uh, briefing? How, how, oh my gosh. I think the one good thing that has come out of all of this is the fact that for a brief period in time, <clears throat> we saw after the New York Times article came out in December 2017, that people that never would have even given this, this subject a glance we're saying, wait a minute, okay, it's on the cover of the New York Times. We might have to take this seriously. And so that was a really great thing <clears throat> in, you know, just taking that at, at face value. It did give people pause, you know, when you're seeing CNN and, and Fox News and, and everybody running articles on that, that does give you hope that maybe people will start to pay attention to the topic because it is critically important. I also, again, have to stress the fact that this is the topic and the subject is being used for, for other motivations and it's not all about disclosure and love and light. So we just need to be <clears throat> mindful on that, excuse me. Um, and so my, my thought on Melinda Leslie, I know, I know she was on here a few weeks back and I really, really enjoyed 
her interview. That was great. She is so prepared. Uh, and I've talked to her, you know, several times about certain people that are, that are involved in this and the my labs she has done a lot of research on that and you know i think that there is some potential uh that we need to look into with regard to that and i in fact i think after i get done with my interview i'm gonna have to give melinda a call and and just really go over she had a, a series of slides in that interview that she did with all of you where she has specific people involved uh, and their allegiance to different uh, organizations, uh, you know, Lockheed Martin, um, the intelligence community, and those are really helpful slides. And I would definitely recommend watching that and paying attention to that, maybe screenshotting some of that because it's important. Um, so what I uh, want to say to people, and then there's also a Stitch is here, and hello, I hope you're doing okay and you're hanging in there. And I wanted to say the hypnotic regression, um, I think that it's very difficult uh, to find people that are necessarily that, that are qualified to do this. And my fear with regard to that is people are leading witnesses. And so I would recommend a lot of caution um, with regard to regression uh, in that regard. But so what I wanted to say uh, in, in closing, and you guys have been wonderful. I've talked about a lot of different subjects here. Uh, is the fact that this is this is such a great um, subject and there's so much look back at the history look back from 47 on look back at the political uh, political factions that integrated themselves into ufology look back at the religious uh, factions that also did as well and then look at how the narrative has been has been promoted and how the intelligence community and different players can can change it and stir it and at the end of the day know that there is something genuine uh, know that there are good people scientists who are effectively engaging this and doing groundbreaking research and also know that a lot of times uh, we are being led away from the truth and we're seeing that now more than ever and so it's critical for us to make sure when we're on a Facebook page or we're on a Twitter feed that we ask questions about the person's background, that we understand where they came from. If somebody appears on the scene out of nowhere, then we need to take heed of that and maybe question what they're doing there and why they're, they're so vocal about specific opinions. And so just be, be conscious, uh, conscious of that and do your due diligence. And I really, honestly, I can't um, thank you enough for giving me the opportunity to talk. I love this subject. I am hooked for the rest of my life. I will be ar archiving and, and doing this and we should all be empowered. And I just, I, w I hope the best for all of you, especially right now during this really frightening time in human history. I hope that you are all safe and all happy and healthy. <laughs> thank you. And, and thank you so much for doing this. It's a, been very informative and on behalf of the whole group uh, we, we're so happy that, that you would do it and come and share your knowledge with us and thank, thank Chris you. for uh, allowing us uh, to hear parts of his story um, and please uh, stay safe and uh, looking forward to seeing what's coming up on your programs uh, there must be coming uh, much more out of this, uh, this story or other stories uh, in the area of Skinwalker. Yes, there there will be, and I think it's really important to keep shining a light, you know, on on this. And as more information comes comes to us, the more we will get that information out. And I think it will also give other people a voice and and a sense of security to come forward with this. So I will keep doing my best on UFO Classified and doing get a that great out job there. there. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice Thank evening. You. Thanks so Bye. much, you guys. You take care. Take care. Bye.